Okay, so let's go back to the Ice Age, to the Pleistocene. In order to understand agriculture, we have to start at the period before we have agriculture. So the Pleistocene or the Ice Age was 12 degrees colder than it is today. It was colder and drier because temperature doesn't just affect <clears throat> the temperature outside it affects precipitation and precipitation rainfall will affect the vegetation the kinds of animals that can grow in certain areas so because there was less rainfall areas in Europe and North America were dry grassland you didn't actually have a lot of vegetation in many areas of North America and Europe at this time to keep these different time periods straight I have this chart uh, in your notes for you to take notes on um, the way I've organized it here is the geologic time period is here the Pleistocene when it ends we enter the next phase called the Holocene we're going to talk more about that during the Pleistocene the kinds of people archaeologically are a group or a time period we would call the Paleolithic lithic means stone paleo means old this is the old stone age over here, when we get to agriculture, as we're going to see, we enter the Neolithic, or the New Stone Age. And there's actually something in between we'll talk about called the Middle Stone Age, right? So this is showing from early periods to later periods, changes through time that we're going to witness. Okay, so what North America and Europe looked like during the Ice Age, the Pleistocene? It was drier. It was colder. You had these large animals that roamed the landscape. Mastodon, you know, woolly mammoth, uh, extinct rhinoceros, saber-toothed tigers, horses that, no you know, that died out in North America. Uh, all of these animals are called megafauna, large animals. Uh, and all of these once existed in North America, but are no longer found, obviously. They went extinct after the Ice Age ended. Uh, humans hunted these animals in North America and Europe and in other parts of the world they also hunted wild animals and they collected wild foods this kind of subsistence is known as hunting and gathering or another term for it is foraging and these are essentially people who don't produce food or grow their own food they only collect what they can find in the wild because the sea levels were lower, it allowed people to go and migrate to different areas. It was, more, uh, it was easier, it was possible. There was no British Channel at this point, so people migrated from the continent of Europe into um, what became you know, the United Kingdom. Uh, people migrated to North America and South America. Right? Every continent on Earth except for Antarctica. All right, what's hunting and gathering like? Right? Well... Uh, some people have a misconception of hunting and gathering. You can see some hunters and gatherers here in this video. These are the Kong or the Kong San. They're a foraging or hunting and gathering group um, that were hunting and gathering up until recently. There's still some that hunt and gather, not many anymore. Um, what they uh, do is they collect wild foods. They know exactly when these wild foods appear. They go from one food source to another food source. They're mobile. They move with the food. They collect things like mangongo nuts. Now in the Arctic, you can see uh, Inuit hunters and gatherers. They mainly have to subsist on hunting because there's not that much uh, plants up there, obviously. So they'll fish. They'll eat uh, sea mammals like seals and whales and things like that. Uh, they also build temporary shelters, and they have to uh, be on the move, right? So uh, they're mobile. Uh, they hunt and gather, right? and uh, you can see that the groups are not very large, right? So you don't see uh, large villages here. You see, you know, 25 to 30 people. This guy just speared a seal through the ice, right? And now he's going to bring it back uh, to his village. You can see he's got his hunting dogs there too. As we're going to see, dogs were the first domesticated animals. So hunting and gathering groups had dogs. Now you see them sharing up and dividing up the meat. In these kinds of societies, sharing is very important. Um, the survival of the group depends on sharing. Uh, so that's, that's essential. And because there is a big importance placed on sharing and because people are mobile, 
uh, there are certain things that they cannot do. Right? Imagine if you know you were mobile. Some of you had to leave your dorms and go and live with uh, you know relatives, or move back uh, t with your parents. Imagine if um, you had to move every three months and you didn't have a car. Um, you, obviously, you wouldn't accumulate a lot of stuff because it would just hinder you and, and uh, slow you down. Hunters and gatherers tend not to accumulate lots of material possessions because they really can't. Um, they have to be mobile. Uh, here you could see a Kung village, right? Temporary shelters. They're sitting in a circle. In many of these societies, people are what we would call egalitarian. That is, they're roughly equal. In those societies, everyone exactly equal, but they're roughly equal. There's no king that could order everyone around. You can see that decisions are made through consensus. They try and come up with uh, a solution to a problem together. And these groups are usually 25 to 30 people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. On average, 25 to 30 people, mobile groups going from food source to food source, collecting wild plants and wild animals. In Europe, during the Paleolithic, you had appearance of artwork like these figurines. Many people think this is a symbol of fertility because it shows a woman who is maybe pregnant and lactating. So maybe that was a symbol of fertility at this time. You also have artwork like cave paintings. Um, caves in Europe were sites where uh, different hunting gathering groups might come together at different times of the year into larger groups uh, for a short period and then split off again into smaller groups. One particular cave art is kind of interesting because it shows uh, as you can see here, it shows some kind of human-animal hybrid. Uh, some people think that this might be a person who transformed into an animal, or maybe it is some sort of important individual who's wearing these animal skins, maybe in the context of a ceremony. Uh, many people believe that what's being depicted in this cave art is what we would call a shaman. Shamans are healers. Uh, they are spiritual leaders in the community. They um, are sometimes called medicine men or medicine women. And you can find shamans almost everywhere in the world today. Shamanism exists in North America. It still can be found in North America, Central America, South America. You can find shamans in Siberia, in Korea. You can find shamans in parts of Europe and Africa. Basically, you can find shamans in Australia. Anywhere humans went on the earth, you can still find some element of shamanism being practiced today. Right? And shamanism involves not only shamans who are these kind of healers, but the belief in spirits that exist in the world. And shamans have the ability to communicate with spirits, to enter the spirit realm, and they use their powers to heal people. So many people believe, because you can find shamanism everywhere in the world, that shamanism and the belief in spirits was probably the earliest religion of human beings. And humans in the Paleolithic probably had shamans, and they probably believed in spirits. And we'll see that shamanism still remains important in cultures throughout the world later on. So it will still be important as we talk about larger societies. Okay, so what happened now after the Ice Age, when the Ice Age ended, right? So you can see around 11,500 BC, the climate all over the world starts to warm up. The ice caps get smaller. They start to retreat. The sea levels rise. Because the water is warmer... There's more evaporation. Because there's more evaporation, there's more rainfall, more moisture. Right? So not only does the temperature change, but the climate around the world changes and improves dramatically. So in parts of North America and Europe that were grass, dry grassland, you would uh, that during the Holocene, you would see forests, streams appear teeming with fish. 
uh, the forest would have medium-sized mammals. You would have lots of new vegetation. In a place like the Middle East, you would have uh, oak trees, pistachio trees, wild wheat, wild barley, wild chickpeas, uh, wild lentils. Right? All of these new plants start to grow very well around the world. And that has a big impact on people, as uh, you know, not surprisingly. So as we leave the Ice Age, we then get into a period called the Middle Stone Age or Mesolithic. Right? And this leads up, this sets the stage for the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. How do archaeologists determine when the Neolithic starts? Well, anytime you have, and we're going to talk about the definition of this, but anytime you have the appearance of agriculture, of farming, that's when the Neolithic starts. Right? So the Neolithic in Europe is not going to start at the same time as the Neolithic in the Middle East. It's not going to be at the same time as the Neolithic in Asia. Right? But once you have farming, agriculture, archaeologists say that's the beginning of the Neolithic. Right? Okay, so after the Ice Age ends, we still do not have farming. We still have hunting and gathering. But because the climate has changed, we start to get a different kind of hunting and gathering. So because there's so much more food locally available, right? You know, in Europe, they would have had to hunt down those megafauna. Now they can fish in rivers teeming with fish. They can bring the fish back and smoke the fish to preserve it. They can hunt deer. They can hunt other medium-sized mammals. They could collect wild plants to eat. Because there's so much food locally available, what do you think starts to happen? What don't people have to do as much? What would you think? If you thought that they wouldn't have to move as much, you're exactly right. Because that's what happens. People don't move for the heck of moving. They move because they have to. And if they don't have to move as much, they're not going to. So we start to see people moving less. We start to see their diets change. There's no more megafauna. Megafauna are gone. And the tools change as a result. So if you had a Paleolithic site in Europe, you would see large spear points to hunt megafauna. During the Mesolithic, you have these kind of small barbed harpoon-like spears for fishing. You would have uh, things to repair nets. Uh, you would have fish hooks. You would have things to make nets and um, chop down trees in the forest. Right. So it's a very different uh, kind of lifestyle uh, because there's more food right? and this is from a time time life magazine showing in the 1950s what they thought the mesolithic was like in europe didn't look like this but it's kind of they're sort of humorous pictures i believe um, because there's more food locally available what else do you think happens more food if you thought greater population and population increase you're exactly right uh, if there's more food available, you can support a larger population. Right? Hunters and gatherers traditionally, they're mobile. In environments that have a limited amount of food, they keep their population levels down. Now if there's more food, you can have more people. So this sets the stage for what happens next. What happens next is agriculture and domestication. What is agriculture? Agriculture is food production, not food collection, but it's actually growing and producing your own food. Typically, that food is, uh, is, comes from domesticated plants and domesticated animals. Okay, so what is domestication? Well, I think it's helpful to, to understand what domestication is, is to understand what domestication also is not. All right, so to look at animals that are wild, they've never been domesticated. These animals in Turkey, this is an area in Turkey where I worked. Uh, these were some of the local sheep. These sheep are domesticated. Um, and one of the key features of this species of domesticated sheep are these very large fat tails that you see. They're fat-tailed sheep. Um, how'd they get these fat tails? We're going to talk about that. But because these fat tails are covering their genitals... Uh, do you think these fat-tailed sheep, if they escaped, could they live in the wild? Could they reproduce in the wild on their own? 
They could not. They're completely dependent on humans. They can't have intercourse or reproduce because their tails cover up the genitalia. Well, how do they reproduce with, uh, when they're living with humans? Well, I, it's always funny when I ask this question in class because I get lots of uh, great answers like artificial insemination and, you know, we're, we're talking about a small village here in Turkey. They're not going to do artificial insemination. What they do is someone lifts up the tail during mating season of a female sheep, right? That's uh, uh, during mating and that's how uh, humans help them reproduce, right? So not my favorite job in the world, um, but that's what you have to do. Okay, so sheep are a good animal domesticate, to domesticate, and they have been domesticated. They were one of the early domesticates in the Middle East, as we're going to see. What about animals that haven't been domesticated? We're going to talk about this in more detail, but let's take a look at... This may seem like an unusual example, but I don't know if you guys saw that recent uh, series, The Tiger King, on Netflix. Uh, at first, I was resistant to watching it. Uh, until I realized after talking to um, a few people that I had actually seen this guy perform at the Center Point Mall in West Michigan. Uh, in the Netflix series, they actually show his tour stops. This is about eight or nine years ago. Um, and one stop you could see clearly on the map is the Center Point Mall on 28th Street. And I have a uh, very clear memory of taking my kids to see him perform magic it was probably one of the worst magic shows i've ever seen um and then also these cages with baby tigers where people were paying to pet the tigers and things like that if you see the series you'll see very clearly that tigers have never been domesticated um you can try to train them and tame them a little bit but that's not domestication at all uh Domestication is something very different. You also see that tigers are not a very good animal to domesticate for many reasons. They're fierce. Uh, they're killers, right? Um, they're very dangerous. But also, um, these guys like Joe Exotic, um, you, you almost went out of business just trying to feed these tigers. Right? You, if you've seen the series, you'll see how they get the meat thrown out from Walmart uh, and, and trash basically dump, a dumpster dive to get meat in order to feed all these tigers. Now, keeping all these tigers is extremely expensive. Is it expensive to keep sheep? No, right? because sheep eat grass. So um, sheep actually produce food for you uh, they produce milk they produce wool so for humans it's just a continuous benefit um, they don't compete with you for food they're eating grass all you have to do is protect them from predators and lead them around and they eat the gr they nibble the grass they're you know uh, they're not going to kill you or eat you um, they give you products Right? As to, you know, versus, let's say, a huge zoo filled with tigers, uh, you're probably going to end up losing money uh, in the end. Right. So there's certain animals that are, are naturally suitable for domestication, as we're going to talk about. And there are animals that are just not suitable to be domesticated. So what is domestication? It's not just taming. Right? As you saw from the sheep and as you see from these varieties of dogs, and as we talked about before, dogs are the very first domesticate. There are biological changes that are involved with domestication. Right? That, uh, that is, you're not just habituating to them to humans. You are selecting for certain individuals to mate, and you are selecting for characteristics. And over time, as you continually select from each generation you end up producing new breeds or even new species right so uh, domestication is a biologic process it, you are actually selecting for traits you're ultimately selecting for genes and you are producing a new biological variant of that animal in order to understand this a little bit better, I'm going to have you guys watch a video from a nature special on PBS that aired a few uh, years ago called um, 
uh, it was about dogs and this particular episode you're going to watch a small clip from it uh, the rise of the dog about the, the domestication of dogs um, the, the one of the best ways to understand how animals were domesticated is to look at a recent example of domestication of animals and that is foxes in the Soviet Union so take a look at that video and then uh, we'll come back and discuss domestication in more detail <laughs> 